Hi, everyone. I'm Artie Marit. I lead conversational AI partnerships at AWS. I've been in the space for, in the conversational AI space for a little over five years. I've seen over 90 billion messages processed by thousands of chatbots and voice assistants. And I'd like to share some of those best practices with everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to do this. So I'm a big believer in conversational AI. I really think it's the, the future of how humans interact. If you remember all those videos of two-year-olds swiping on the iPads and iPhones, the same thing happens with devices like Alexa and uh, Google Assistant. Kids already know how to, to interact. Um, you can see chatbots and voice assistants used across a wide variety of industries. It's not just in customer service, but you see it in financial services, insurance, retail, travel, government, education. There's just a wide variety of places where you can implement these. The challenge is with conversational interfaces is it's all unstructured data. Users can say or send whatever they want to them. So it's hard to build for that, to know the ways people might uh, communicate. So building for conversational AI, it's really an iterative, iterative process. There's the NLP models, the use cases and defining those models and training phrases. There's the conversation designs and flows. There's all the backend data integration. And then there's testing, monitoring, measurement in a complete iterative process. So let's talk about some of the best practices. First, in terms of getting started and selecting use cases, where you want to start, there's a few common use cases you see in chatbots. There's the informational ones, where's my order, what's the weather, there's data capture, maybe it's signing up for an appointment or, or registering for a newsletter, transactional use cases, like sending money uh, from your account. And then what we're starting to see is more proactive use cases where the chatbot is monitoring usage behavior and proactively uh, reaching out to see if you need help or, or following up. So to get started, it's best to start simple and iterate. High volume, low complexity tasks are, are a great place to start. Think of like checking your order, or maybe it's uh, store hours or these kind of things and get that quick win and then iterate. If you have historical data that you can look at to help decide what use cases, that's a great place to start. And it's important to remember that what works on the web doesn't necessarily work in conversational interfaces. There's folks that sometimes try to regurgitate their FAQs and that just doesn't work that well. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the NLP models and, and how we go about building those. So just as a reminder, just so everyone's on the same page, with natural language understanding, if I was to say, what's the weather in London, that, that's the utterance or, or the phrase, the intent there is to check weather, and the entities, just to, we're talking about the same terms, is the location equals London. So coming up with these models and training phrases can be a challenge. If you have historical data that you can mine, this is the, the best place to start. There's not really a, a substitute for real data. And one way to do this is with what's called semantic similarity clustering. And there's these tools from like TensorFlow, uh, Universal Sentence Encoder, there's BERT, there's a website called PyRobot. You can cluster all the, the phrases that users are sending to your live agents, and it can help you identify potential intents as well as those training phrases. For example, here, there's a lot of requests for refund it mentioned in different ways. So this is a starting point to, to say, perhaps we should have a refund intent, and here are some of the training phrases that we can use. If you don't have live data, crowdsourced and pre-made models can be quite helpful. It's one thing to keep in mind, though, with crowdsourcing is there might be biases there if the, if the crowdsource folks are based in a different location than you are, some international uh, biases. There could also be internal biases when you're asking folks for how they might say something. If, for example, there was a customer that I work with where they referred to their product catalog as the order book. And so if they were to say, how do you search for something in the order book, people might not understand what that even means to come up with training phrases. And then if you're using pre-made models, it, you most likely will need to customize these for your specific use case, but they can be a good starting point. M much like with the use case development, it's best to keep this simple to start. Try, uh, try to limit the complexity of the intents and entities, not to have too many entities in the intents, just to get started and, and get those uh, early wins in usage. And then you can just keep iterating based on the data. So let's chat about what makes a good user experience and how to go about building one for conversation. For starters, 
uh, onboarding is a great opportunity to educate your users. For starters, you should welcome them, <laughs> but welcome the user, set the expectations of what chatbot can do, and perhaps give them some hints and suggestions of what they can ask. If you're in a text-based uh, interface, providing quick reply buttons can be quite helpful. But we saw with the data that chatbots that had a mixture of, of text and uh, buttons, about 30% buttons it tend to have a little bit better engagement, but here we're welcoming the user and letting them know what they can do. Context and personalization are key. What is the user doing? Where are they? Are, are they out and about? Are they driving a car? Are they in the kitchen? Their hands are, are, are busy. Uh, what modality are they on? Is it uh, a, a device that only has audio? Is it one with the screen? These are all important things to keep in mind when you're building your, your interface. For example, with, with, with voice, you, you tend to want to have shorter, quicker responses and get to the point. With text, you can make use of the buttons and quick replies. And you'll see the user's responses are different too. Like in text, people will communicate with a shorthand and we use emoticons that you're not going to see in voice. Personalization can come in quite handy. This, this is one area when the more data you have can actually be quite helpful in helping understand the user's issue faster, knowing more about them and being able to resolve um, the, the, their issue a little bit quicker. If, for example, if you've ever booked a, an airline ticket and then you call the airline, you often get prompted. They'll say, hey, are you calling about the, the flight you just booked? And this is something to keep in mind if you have a repeat user, Consider streamlining the, the flow so the person doesn't have to start from the beginning each time. Fail gracefully. This is the biggest takeaway. It's hard to build for these interfaces. It's hard to know all the ways people might say things or what they might ask. And so the trick is to um, get them back on that happy path. And much like the onboarding, it's letting the user know what the chatbot can do. If you're in the text space, interface showing buttons or quick replies and just helping them get back uh, on track. And a key piece of that is providing a path to escalation, which we'll chat about in a little bit. One thing that I found that worked pretty well is falling back to a knowledge base. So instead of your fallback saying, I don't know what you're asking, uh, one customer that I work with, what they would do is pass that user query into their knowledge base and come back with a few articles uh, that they could share that might answer the user's uh, question. And then they would add tracking to those links to see if people click them or not. And they would also um, prompt the user for feedback. Was that helpful or not? And that's all things you can feed back into the chat bot. Chatbots and voice assistants provide a great opportunity to reinforce your, your brand and your voice. Uh, I found with the, the ones that incorporated some form of personality tended to have higher engagement. There's a fine line, though. You have to be careful that you don't overdo it. And that's why you often find folks will use uh, screenwriters or comedians to build these conversation flows because they understand that timing a bit better. If you do add some sort of personality to your chatbot, it's important to keep a, a guide to maintain that consistency. There are common messages that chatbots get that you should be able to handle. Hi and hello is the most common chatbot message. But it, it's interesting, still more than 30, almost 40% of chatbots don't respond appropriately with any kind of welcome message back. Help is also very helpful. About 50% of the chatbots getting help don't respond with anything uh, remotely close to helpful. If someone asks for help, it, this is a new environment for people providing uh, clues on what they can do, a quick replies, menu options can can actually help them. Similarly, with, with stop, uh, about 60% of the chatbots that get stopped don't actually stop. So if you're using a platform like SMS or Facebook Messenger that allows for asynchronous messaging, you should really listen to that stop command and, and provide some means for the people to opt out. I, I had a customer that was sending sports scores and they found when the fans of a team uh, that was uh, th their team was losing, they would get upset and they would end up blocking the chatbot. And then this company had to pay uh, to run ads to reacquire them. And they saw this, so they added a pause functionality, and that meant the difference between a retained user and a lost user. You, you see this in voice too. You, you you see messages come across that folks are trying to get back 
to the you know assistant home, like get back to Google Home. And that sometimes happens if you're sending messages and leaving it open for a user response. If your skill isn't really set up for that, then then don't leave that opening because you can get people uh, stuck. And, and similarly with thanks, people do tell you what they think of the chatbots. It, it can actually be positive and, and, and they do thank your chatbot. Uh, and about 60% of the chatbots don't respond with anything close to uh, appropriate for that. You know, I mentioned escalation earlier. Well, businesses and enterprises are building chatbots to uh, reduce the call volume. Uh, providing a path to escalation is still important for the, the overall customer experience. I, I ran a survey where 70% of users, that's what they wanted, that path to escalation. And chatbots provide a way to escalate more efficiently, passing along the context to help the agent out to, to be able to answer the, the questions. If you don't have live agents, one thing you can do is escalate them to your troubleshooting, your email system, so the user can still get additional help. Chatbots provide a great way to, to collect, gather feedback and collect uh, more information from, from users. So they tell you what they think of your, your chatbot. Why not just ask them? It's in conversation. So ask, was that helpful? Did that answer your question? Are you satisfied with that response? If you do ask this, it's important to look at the data and make sure that you're incorporating this um, back into your chatbot. A key thing to, to, to keep in mind is how you generate awareness and let people know these chatbots exist. So if you're doing something that's more customer service related, a common place you see this is pervasive across the website or app. It's often in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, you can add it to your support page. And if you do, you, you probably want to prompt them for reasons why they should use the chatbot. This is 24-7. It's available whenever you like. Uh, we can respond quickly. There was a company that for their IT support, they would tell the internal users, why don't you just use the chatbot because the internal support person is going to use it anyway, so save yourself the time and start with the chatbot. If you're doing anything more entertainment or, or, or marketing related, using your existing marketing channels and social media, especially if it's like a voice skill, can be quite effective too. I just want to chat a little bit about background, uh, integrating backends. This gets qu quite complex, but if you're doing, uh, uh, if you're building a, a chatbot, you're, you're inevitably integrating with some type of backend, whether it's CRM systems, your accounts and transactions and all those kind of things. So there's some, some stuff that you have to keep in mind. First, it's authentication. Folks often start with use cases that don't require authentication just to get started, but you keep in mind, uh, how you handle authentication. Is the person already authenticated in the app, the website, you're doing two-factor, if it's voice, um, you're using account linking. Data compliance starts to come into play, things like GDPR and CCPA around keeping users' privacy and data intact. Um, there are tools like for PII redaction, like Redact PII is an NPM module. Th those are things you can use to, to, um, to handle that. And let's chat a bit more about testing and, and monitoring and measurement. So prior to launch, there's a, a bunch of different ways you can test your chatbot or, or voice assistant. There are tools out there that help you diagram those flows, and that can help you figure out that, that, that flow a bit better and, and test. Things like voice flow can help you with that as you, as you diagram it out. One thing that we saw work pretty well in voice is having somebody act like the device itself and then one person communicates with it, and you can start to see, were those responses effective? Were they too long? Can I reduce them? Um, there are automated and crowdsourced tools like Bespoken and Pulse Labs that can help you with this. And then you can also analyze the models itself. That's for the, the flows. One way to analyze the models is applying that same semantic similarity clustering. You cluster all the training phrases regardless of the intent, and it can start to show you where there's collisions and overlaps that might cause some issues with your NLP. It's important to look at the, at the intents to identify the mishandled and unhandled intents so you can improve that overall response effectiveness. So in, th this is where that semantic similarity comes into play again. You cluster the, the, the phrases, and you can see here in this example, these are all virtually the same. They're users 
trying to get their order status and the cluster shows them as being semantically similar. But in some cases, it's going to the proper intent, the order status, where's my order? In other cases, what's the ETA on my order? It's hitting the fallback, I don't know, response. So that could be an opportunity to add this as a training phrase to that intent. In other cases, it's hitting a completely different intent. Like the last one, I'm looking for my package, is hitting the search intent. So perhaps you want to mon modify your training phrases uh, to... Uh, better align with, 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 with the intents. If you find a cluster of phrases that are all hitting the fallback, that could be a new intent to add, and those could be the training phrases to use. It's also important to look at just the intents and messages themselves. Uh, to, this can help you identify common themes. Uh, why are people reaching out to your chatbot? I, I noticed folks chatting about COVID back in January of 2020 before it even got uh, more mainstream just by seeing the, the, these common themes bubbling up in uh, chatbot communications. And it's not just the top messages, but the bottom too. There was a customer that they would look at their bottom intents and they realized those intents were the ones that were a bit too complex. They had too many entities and, and they, the, the users never really triggered them. And by streamlining those intents, they were actually able to uh, uh, get users down those paths and, and, and help them out. Transcripts provide a wealth of information and a lot of deeper insights and context into what's actually happening. So in this case, this is an escalation. We can look at the transcript and see what occurred? So the user is asking for help, but perhaps the way they're asking for it isn't triggering the intent. They're using short uh, shorthand. Uh, they're not asking it in the, the question. And so this is a way to figure out perhaps we should add these as training phrases and let's improve this, this uh, process. It's important to look at the overall customer satisfaction too. Folks are building these chatbots not just for containment, but for uh, improving the overall experience. You can do that by looking at sentiment analysis. That can give you an indicator. If you are gathering information, if you're prompting users on whether the responses were effective, uh, look at the data and see how they were answering that and then decide whether you want to perhaps add support for those um, or modify the, the, the answers for those intents. And most importantly, it's, you need to track your KPIs. What are your goals? So monitor and measure those conversation paths, the conversions, the escalations. Is your conversion to get someone to book an appointment, to purchase something, to sign up for a mailing list, uh, whatever, or get past something where they're stuck, those jobs done? You, you can monitor those flows, see where those things are breaking down and what's causing the escalation too, like where were people getting stuck and, and asking for the agent? And it's important not to like over index on the, on the containment because you could try to get 100% containment by just never escalating um, and then your users won't be happy about that. Um, but it's really important to look at, at, at the goals and see how you're uh, meeting them. And, and lastly, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is an iterative process. So uh, all the data that you're capturing, feed that back in, feed that into your NLP models, into the conversation design and the, and the backend integrations, and just keep uh, iterating on this process uh, to build a more effective chatbot experience. So I appreciate uh, uh, taking the time to hear, hear this. If you want to reach me um, on LinkedIn and on Twitter at Hardy Merritt, uh, happy to answer any questions uh, folks have as well.